We're going to start the session. And uh, I'll start by saying that we have got a terrific group of speakers uh, for you for this session. And we're going to be talking mostly about um, the Lote World Tower, uh, among some other ideas about tall buildings. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, Mr. Kim is going to introduce the, the speakers, and we, we will we'll try very hard to, to stay on schedule because we're a little bit behind. Uh, so Mr. Kim, please. Good morning. I'm, I'm ji Young Kim, working at Dale Engineering and Construction Company. Uh, the first speaker is uh, uh, Leslie Robertson and uh, So Tin C. Uh, the title is uh, title is two super highlights highlights in itself. Leslie E. Robertson is a global innovator as a director of the design at Leslie E. Robertson and Associations. Dr. Robertson currently, currently sorry. Dr. Robertson currently works on the structural designs for the Jamshil Lotte World Tower, Seoul, and the KL100 Tower, Malaysia. And So Tin C, uh, Ms. So, so Tin C is the managing partner of the Leslie Robertson Association. She joined to Palm in, Palm in 19, 1978 and became a partner in 1986. Please, Leslie Robertson. Well, good morning. We appreciate you all coming this morning. It, uh, I know it's a big program. Uh, I start out first with an apology uh, because uh, we're not, in fact, going to talk about two structural systems. We're going to talk about only one. Uh, and that's because uh, we learned immediately there wasn't enough time, actually, to talk about both. And perhaps even more importantly, uh, following us uh, one of the partners of Cohn Pedersen Fox, and we wouldn't want to impinge on, on his town. Anyway, the, the owner of the project, of course, is Lotte. Um, the architect and our client is Cohn Pedersen Fox out of New York. Uh, and our partner in charge is uh, Satine C, and she's going to take over the podium right now. I'm going to stand on the box here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Les. So some key facts on the project. It's a 555-meter-tall super high-rise. It's a mixed-use occupancy with uh, offices in the lower portions, followed by office tell. The upper portions have hotel and um, premium office spaces. At the very top, there's an observation deck. The, uh, as you can see from the uh, picture, the, the plan of the building the, it has a graceful taper to it. Um, the structural system consists of reinforced concrete services core with eight concrete mega columns. There are steel outrigger trusses and steel belt trusses. In addition, there are steel small perimeter columns. The uh, floor framing for the office consists of slab on deck on steel beams and uh, same for the apartment hotel, the office tell, I mean. The, uh, the hotel itself has, office, uh, has concrete floor framing. Within the services core, the floor slabs are all reinforced concrete. This shows the uh, key members of the structural system, the uh, reinforced concrete core, which has three sets of outriggers reaching out to the eight mega columns. In addition, we have uh, small perimeter columns, which, are, which loads are transferred out at each of the belt trusses. Um, you can see some of the elevations of these belt trusses here. Oh, the picture is missing here. Um, this is the uh, foundation level which is a reinforced concrete mat, six and a half meters thick. Some of you who are going off to the site this afternoon may see some of this construction. The, um, this is one of the outrigger belt truss levels. The um, blue, oops, sorry. 
the uh, re reinforced concrete core walls with the outrigger trusses in steel. That's three story highs, as is the belt truss that rings around the building. The small steel perimeter columns, the loads of which are transferred out at the belt truss levels to the mega columns. I think some slides are missing here. <laughs> This is the uh, typical floor framing for the office, which is very conventional. Slap on deck on steel beams, framing to the core walls and the spandrels. Uh, floor beams 590 deep, spandrels 690 deep. This is the plan detail of the corner framing. One perimeter column here and two corner columns here. And some minor cantilevers. For the office tell, uh, because of the need to keep the FAR down uh, and to reduce the lease span, we have void spaces created around the perimeter of the core. To maintain the diaphragm action, we still have bracing that connects the floor framing outside of the core to the core walls. For the hotel, to improve the acoustics, the acoustical separation between the office or hotel levels. We have a concrete slab framing. There are band beams around the perimeter and around the edges of the core walls. That's the missing slide. <laughs> it's out of location. Anyway, this, is the, this plan shows the core walls, the primary core walls, and four inner walls which form part of the lateral system. Most of these walls do continue down to the foundation level. As is our practice, we have built into the structural system uh, robustness and redundancy in the primary structural system as, in, as well as in the secondary system. The steel perimeter columns are designed for the normal load case to be transferred out at the belt truss levels. As well, should there be any accidental failure in the perimeter column, the columns were designed to act as hangers, transferring the load to the belt trusses above. Similarly, should any single member of the belt truss fail for whatever reason, the perimeter columns are transferred out to the belt trusses above or down to the belt trusses below. So we don't have a situation where the failure of any secondary member would cause disproportionate collapse in the building. As you know, the concrete has creep and shrinkage, while structural steel doesn't. The mega columns, being of reinforced concrete, deform and shorten over time with creep and shrinkage effects, while the steel perimeter columns do not. Because of this, big forces are introduced into the steel perimeter columns to minimize the effects of this creep and shrinkage on the steel columns, we have kept, we have used high yield strength for the steel columns. That way they will attract less forces from the creep and shrinkage of the mega columns. The forces introduced in the steel perimeter columns act particularly on the belt trusses which are at the highest level and the lowest level. At the intermediate levels, the forces kind of balance out. So how does the building perform in the wind? This is a picture of the building in the wind tunnel in, at RWDI. This is one of several tests that were conducted on the building. We had the usual force balance test, the pressure test, and the aeroelastic test. Uh, 
I think there's a few missing slides here. Um, this is a plot of the uh, accelerations versus os the frequency of oscillation of the building. This is the AIJ criteria. Um, the green line is show, shows the, uh, where 10% of the population would sense or perceive the accelerations of the building and gradually increases to the 90%. As you can see, our building, which is around 10 second period, is between the 10 and 30% perception level. Um, we show this slide, even though we do not really believe in drift as a criteria for evaluating the performance of a building under wind loads. Um, nevertheless, under the design wind at the top occupied floor, the building being very stiff has H over 550 deflection. This is the uh, seismic hazard map for Asia from the USGS service uh, for peak ground accelerations for 475 year return period. Japan being red and orange, Seoul in Korea being blue, yellow. This shows that Korea has low to moderate seismic risk. The Lotte Tower, this shows the relative base shears acting on the building from the Seoul earthquake or an earthquake from Los Angeles and the design wind for Seoul. So you can see that the wind loads are overwhelmingly higher than the base shears from earthquake. Similarly, for the base overturning moment, the uh, Seoul earthquake is very small compared to the Los Angeles earthquake, and even smaller than the design wind. So the building is controlled by, mostly by the wind loads, except perhaps at the very top of the building where earthquakes may govern. Some of the key details in the project this shows the three-story belt truss, one of them, framing between the mega columns. The gravity loads of the small steel perimeter columns are transferred here at this level to the mega columns. As you can see, the belt truss frames to the exterior of the mega column and not to the center of the mega column. The members of the belt trusses are box-shaped members with thicker steel plates in the vertical planes. And the, we have designed all the members of the belt truss such that all the forces are carried in the vertical plates. This shows the transfer of the gravity loads from the belt truss to the centroid of the mega column. This is a zero, mo moment free transfer. Uh, it's a shear transfer mechanism that we have developed for use in other projects. With this transfer, we have axial forces created, which are carried in beams, which frame to the core walls. These axially loaded beams are on the top floor and the bottom court level of the belt trusses. There are shear plates with um, dowels embedded deep into the mega columns. This is one of the outrigger truss diagonal connecting to the embedded cord within the core walls. For the three-dimensional nature of the connection, we have uh, shown a casting and the Steel outrigger diagonal is connected through only the flanges. The webs are trimmed back, as you can see here, and all the loads are carried through the flange plates. This simplifies the construction enormously. <clears throat> A 
This is an elevation. Here's a casting. These are weldments and weldments here. We, the outrigger diagonal is left loose or loosely connected to allow the differential settlement of the core with respect to the mega column. The connection is tightened after most of the differential settlement has taken place. At the top of the building, we have the digrid structure for the lantern, which supports, uh, this is composed of pipe bracing. This shows the weldment of the pipe, which is sharp fabricated. Um, Bolts are used to connect each of the pipe members together, but the connection is all hidden. There's an excess hole here that allows the impact wrench to be inserted into the pipe to tighten the high tensile bolts. The uh, excess hole is later covered and seal welded. So this bracing here is on the inner plane, which is uh, in a vertical plane, and this is on the outside plane, which is curved. So the design of this Lantern structure is governed by earthquake loads and not wind loads. The mega column, which is reinforced concrete. Here we show how we splice the bundles of four D50 bars. The bars are saw cut for full bearing, held together by a steel alignment sleeve, which achieves full bearing capacity. These splices are staggered by at least the bond length of the bar. That way, we have, at any cross section, we have full compressive capacity of the four bar bundle, and three quarters of the bars are developed in tension at any location without the need for lap splices or mechanical couplers. So this is a very efficient detail. We have, that's the end of the talk. So we have, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Does, does anybody have uh, a question uh, that they'd like to ask? Professor Wada. How do you find it? We didn't show the ties, but there are many ties that cross and are anchored into the reinforced core. Sorry. Uh, understand. Uh, beyond that, uh, we have to understand that these mega columns are, is, are really essential to the integrity of the building. And therefore, uh, our recommendation is that the fire resistance of these mega columns be rather substantially more than for typical columns. I, I actually have one question. Um, Regarding the redundancy idea that you've introduced, I, I applaud you for that. I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea. And I guess the question is, um, what, what, what kind of increased demand did you find on those belt truss systems um, that were, was over and above what you uh, would, would have designed for otherwise? Was there a, a big premium to that? No, there was a premium, but it was pretty small. When we considered the disproportionate collapse case, we lowered the factor of safety. I see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? There's one back there. 
Are, are the alignment sleeves in the slide uh, simply loose sleeves that the rebars are sitting on top of each other? Yes, they are sheet metal sleeves basically to hold the bars together hmm. because the bars are soft cut for full bearing. And so those particular bars don't perform in uh, tension then? Well, since the splices are staggered by at least the bond length, at any cross section, three quarters of the bars are effective in tension. That's very innovative. Thank you. We have used it before in many other projects. Anybody else? Okay, so we'll move on to our next presentation. Thank you very much.